You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer, and the Crown Plaza at Union Station and Grand Hall Conference Center located downtown Indianapolis. Today we are here with pioneer, <laughs> fashionista, <laughs> and all-around amazing local leader, wow. city county counselor, Maggie Lewis. Thank you, Maggie, for coming here today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. It was a hard slog getting you on the podcast, I... but I have a feeling the next hour is going to be well worth it. It, it will. I'm sorry. My schedule gets a little crazy. Well, it's not like you aren't doing stuff. <laughs> Just a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> we are joined today by the CEO of Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Danielle Shockey, and she is going to start it off. Uh, we should probably say that these two have a lot in common because they're both head of major, major nonprofits that are making an impact in Central Indiana and beyond. So, Danielle, with that, why don't you get started? All right. Well, thanks for letting us join you today. And Robert mentioned and introduced you as city councilwoman, which yes. is one full-time hat mm -hmm. you wear. Mm -hmm. But then we're also sitting in your office here as CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Central Indiana. Um, also a big, a big role that you play. It is. So I guess my first question would be, tell our listeners just your path to community leadership um, where did you grow up? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. did you get involved in, in the work that you do? Mm -hmm. And what led you to joining the Boys and Girls Club in May of 2018? Yes. Um, so first, thank you all both for being here. Um, so so my path to leadership, that there's a loaded question. So um, my mom had me at the age of 16 years of age. I watched my mom um, work two and three jobs to ensure that we had everything that we needed. Um, growing up poor, uh, moving back and forth from Columbus, Indiana and Indianapolis, Indiana, um, I knew early on that I would land somewhere in the giving field. Again, growing up poor, we were, lived in the projects, but my mom often invited folks into our home. And so my brother and I would come downstairs and we would see folks like sleeping on our floor. We would see my mom like making these meals for everybody. So I knew pretty much that I would go in something that would allow me to give back to the community. My mom taught me early on um, that I was called to do great things, that I would call, I was called to do big things. She never defined what those big things were, but she always said, Maggie Ann, you're going to do something big. You were called to be great, whatever that greatness is. And so she pushed and she pushed. Um, I went to five elementary schools growing up. So I feel like I do believe that because of that constant movement in my life that I was able, I'm able to navigate different groups, different crowds, um, and just move about freely. Um, so she often said that I would have to go to school. And so um, when graduation was coming up, she was like, you got to get out of here. I don't know where you're going, but you got to go. And so um, I drifted off to Terre Haute, Indiana, where I um, received an undergraduate degree in um, community education, community health education, and a master's degree in public administration. So um, just I, I knew I needed to do something as far as my education that would support me being able to serve community, serve the community. Now, in school, I had to work really hard. I was not naturally as this smart gal, I had to study a whole lot. But again, um, what I felt like my gift was, was serving other, helping other people, um, community service types of, of, of work. Um, that's what was natural to me. Um, so 
Fast forward, landed in Indianapolis. I went to the big city. I am a Hoosier. I lived within a hundred mile radius my entire life. Indianapolis, Columbus, Indiana, Terre Haute. So I'm a real Hoosier. Um, landed in Indianapolis, worked at a, a lot of amazing not for profit um, organizations. I did go to what I call the dark side for about three years. I went to the gaming and entertainment industry. Loved every minute of it. I mean, I had a blast. However, I read too many profit and loss statements. I stayed up way too late and my heart ached for getting back in the not-for-profit space. And so when this opportunity came um, about, I had some conversations with some folks and I was like, you know, I'm okay in this gaming industry, I was actually making a decent living for the first time because, as you know, in not-for-profit space, you do not do it to be rich, right? Um, so lots of conversations about the organization. I went into a boys and girls club and I fell in love. Now, I was a club kid in Columbus, Indiana, and all these emotions came about. And I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. And so in May, I accepted that position. And it has been heaven sent Ever since I accepted the position, I absolutely love the work that we do. I love the mission. I love the kiddos. I love what it stands for. And it feeds my soul, my spirit to be able to give back um, to, to give back in such a meaningful way. So for our listeners who may not be familiar with the, with the Boys and Girls mm-hmm. Clubs, describe mm-hmm. for them what role they do play in our communities Mm -hmm. and what is its mission? Mm -hmm. So our mission is to serve the kids that need us most. We have 10 facilities throughout um, our amazing city. Um, We mentor kiddos. We feed kiddos. We, we show them what the possibilities are, what opportunities look like. Um, We care for them and give them basically their wings. We do whatever it takes to ensure that at the end of the day that they are going to be successful, productive citizens. How do you think, so talk a little bit about your role in the city council. Mm -hmm. Um, I imagine that you have this perspective of our city Mm -hmm. and its areas for potential growth Mm -hmm. and need and future and how you can really maybe almost capitalize on the two roles together, Mm -hmm. right? You Mm -hmm. can see what youth need and then make it come to life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen such connection yet? Yeah. So being a member of the city county council, we get to really study the city and a county. And like you said, we know where those gaps are. Um, and being a social service provider, and I've been, like I said, I've been in social services my entire career, except for those three, three years. Um, I've been able to, to use that platform to speak on what is truly needed in our community, whether it's addressing addictions in our community, um, the homeless issues in our community, education in our community. Um, I get to take that experience and, and, and bring it to the city county council. So I'm able to use my, my work experience, my professional experience and bring it to the attention to of the, the rest of my colleagues on the city county council. Yeah. So a similar question then. Um, I'd like to think that all of our citizens are very uh, in tune with local design of government, mm-hmm. um, but maybe not. So mm-hmm. talk about what does the, the what what does the city council represent? Mm-hmm. Who do you represent? Mm-hmm. How do you come together? What is your major mm-hmm. focus? Just describe that maybe for our yeah. listeners. So as a member of the city county council, we are. Um, you're the legislative body. We are equivalent to Congress is to the president of the United States is how I often describe it. Um, we're responsible for your local taxes. We're lo- we're responsible for police and fire, the library, the air- airport, those municipal corporations. But we are the purse strings to the city, of city and the city and um, Marion County. Very good. All right. And I think I. I, I think I remember you were the first woman to serve as president. Yeah, I had the honor. I had the honor of serving as the first female to lead the city county council, which is just bizarre to me at this um, date. Like I'm the first female, and you know, I did not take that for granted. I recognize that there are and there were like some amazing women before me that served um, on that on that body. Yeah. So. I'm from the Girl Scouts. You mm-hmm. were a Girl Scout. Yeah, You've been honored as the as a Girl Scout yeah. woman leader yeah. in our community. Um, 
how, what would you say to girls? You know, you were the first woman. Mm-hmm. And like you just said, it was kind of surprising. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But sadly, that happens a lot. It happens a lot. We it, still see women being the first. Right, right. What advice would you have for girls, young girls, about how how to take action, how to have a voice, how to make sure that in the future we aren't the first anymore, that they're one of and a litany of 10 mm-hmm. leaders that are girls and women. It, I, you know, we say this often to, to girls, dare to dream and think outside the box, but they really have to be able to do that and be comfortable um, dreaming big dreams. And the sky really is the limit. And so um, approach every day with boldness like we have to as women as young girls we have to be comfortable being bold and not being put in some kind of box right like you just you know I I I, I shared earlier that my mom told me that God was called to do great things. And she instilled that in me early on. I didn't know what that greatness was or what it looked like and what it would, where it would land me. But I knew that like I was supposed to go about life doing bold things. And that stayed with me. I heard it all of my life. And not all young ladies are going to hear that. But we as leaders, we have to reach back and we have to be comfortable telling our girls that you can truly do anything that you want to do. Talk about, so you mentioned bold and big a couple times. Mm -hmm. What's something that you are most proud of that you would consider big and bold in your own career? In my own career? Um, being the first female to serve as president of the city county council, I did not set out to be in politics. Nothing in my past said that I would be a member of the city county council, let alone be the leader of the of that crazy pack, right? Um, so serving as president of the city county council, doing the work with um, Al Hubbard on the um, Lewis Hubbard group, um, getting out front on transit, um, on mass transit. Like I'm excited to see that red line with all the things that are happening with it, you know, and with trying new things and being bold, there's going to be issues along the way, but I am crazy proud of that red line out there on Meridian street, capital, capital street. Um, I am ecstatic about the work that we did with pre-K with Mayor Greg Ballard. Those are the things that really, really excite me. Thinking to the future, if you could pick a couple things that need to be big and bold for our city to keep advancing, what would you, what's on the horizon Mm -hmm. for you? Like you think this needs to happen first. I I think we continue on the transit piece. I, I, I think that our city deserves a transit system that that is as sexy as we describe our our city, right? And it's not just for a certain type or a certain class. In order for us to continue to elevate and grow, we need to have this robust system. We need to be able to get throughout the city of Indianapolis. We need to get to Greenwood. We need to get to Carmel. Like we need to be able to park our vehicles if we want and move about freely. So I think we we need to stay there. I think we need to continue the conversation on education. I think education is so important. It's it's a deal breaker for some folks when they consider moving to our community. So how do we ensure that we have this great education system and not just one system, whether it's charter, whether it's public, whether it's township schools, how do we as a community wrap our minds around making our education system better for everyone in our community. Are we getting there? I I think we are. I I really do believe we're getting there. And I know that um, I think sometimes our egos in the past, things that happen in the past in our community keeps us from moving a little bit swifter. I like things to happen pretty quick. That's not my, that's not my, my gift in life. Like I want things to happen quickly. Um, However, um, I I think we're getting there and I think we are doing better with having those tough conversations about education, those honest conversations about education, but we are definitely making progress. Very good. What about you mentioned your mom said something to you Mm -hmm. over and over again? Mm -hmm. Not every girl, little girl ends up to have such great success. Mm -hmm. Where and how can that happen if it's not in the home? Like as a, mm-hmm. as a society, mm-hmm. how can we make sure that every little girl and just this is just mm-hmm. in Maggie's opinion mm-hmm. can have somebody like your mom? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's program. I think it's the social service agencies. I think it's Girl Scouts. I think it's Boys and Girls Clubs. I think it's our teachers. I think it should happen in the churches. Um, I, I think mentorship is so important. Um, I think. 
at times I feel um, that we as a community overlook the role of our social service agencies. I think that it, the same way that we invest in businesses, we should be investing in our not-for-profit space because, it can, again, it can make or break a community, right? We do that that work that truly touch folks' everyday lives. That's actually a really good segue I wanted to touch upon since I think Robert mentioned you and I both are in roles leading mm-hmm. these nonprofit mm-hmm. youth spaces and fairly new in mm-hmm. our roles, mm-hmm. both of us less mm-hmm. than two years. The nonprofit landscape of being able to run an, an organization like Boys and Girls Club mm-hmm. and Girl Scouts is becoming more and more challenging. Right. Describe where that challenges come from and what do you think needs to change or give regarding the way in which we as nonprofits seek support in the community mm-hmm. or the way in which the community begins to understand that we do serve a greater purpose? Mm-hmm. I, I think oftentimes in the not-for-profit space, we get busy doing the work and we forget to tell our stories, right? And so people do not give to organizations or individuals that they, they don't hear from. And so one of my biggest takeaways when I was away from the not-for-profit space is marketing and telling that story. I think, again, we get into this space truly to help others become better or find their greatness, right? We don't do it to boast, But again, in order for us to raise those dollars, raise awareness, we have to get out there and start telling that story more and more. We have to market our non-for-profits. And then also the costs associated with our work. Um, We In non-for-profit, we call it overhead. Well, if we don't have the people to do the work, we can't do the work, right? So it's the cost to do a business. And so we have to speak the same language as business folks do, right? And so... Yes, in order for us to do what we need to do, we have to have caseworkers. We have to have social workers. We have to have someone to drive the buses, right? It's not overhead. It's the cost of doing business. And what does that cost to save a person's life, mm. right? <laughs> it's a hard price tag to come up with. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What? Um, so again, back to the Boys and Girls Club, mm-hmm. strategic thinking for the future there. You mentioned 10 sites. Mm-hmm. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. But again, we come back to the dollar and cents in the not-for-profit space. You know, we get requests all the time like, hey, we need a a club um, down south, further south or further west. Um, I would love to open up more space. But again, we're all competing for those same dollars. And so how do I ensure that if we do open a space that it's around, you know, three, five, 10 years. This organization has been in this community 126 years. The last thing I want to do is grow and then have to come back and then close a space. Uh, what is the number of boys and girls that you do serve? Is it annually, I guess, yeah, maybe the right number? Up to the like 7,000 mark um, unduplicated. And so those are the members. And so it goes beyond that because we open our space to the community and have other kids come in that we don't necessarily count, but annually six to 7,000 every year. Wow. And those are children who also it impacts their family. We talk about yeah. two generation impact, right? Exactly. That definitely does that. It, it definitely does that. And so we provide this, sp- this safe space for kiddos to come and just be themselves while mom, dad, auntie, whoever that caregiver is to go out and work, go to school and do whatever they need to do to take care of the family. So I'm going to be uh, selfish and ask you the Girl Scout question, like your Girl Uh-oh. Scout story. You were a Girl Scout. Um, tell us a little bit about what that was like and did it have an impact on mm-hmm. on you growing up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was a Girl Scout in Columbus, Indiana. And the biggest thing for me, it gave me a a place to belong, like a sense of like, this is mine. This is something that belongs to Maggie and London. Um I was able to be around a bunch of positive girls. Um, My leader, I remember just looking up to her, thinking, wow, when I grow up, I wanted to be like her. She was professional. She was kind. Um, And so moving back and forth, um, like I said, I went to five different schools. And so when I got back to Columbus to be a brownie, to be a Girl Scout, that really felt special to me. Again, it was something that I owned, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's the same for our girls now. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a safe space. It's a safe space with right? women who they look up to. Mm-hmm. It becomes mm-hmm. this intimate relationship, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. oftentimes they don't find mm-hmm. elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And the space, like now that I'm older, I appreciate going to this this space with the other girls. Again, growing up poor in some of the neighborhoods that we were at, um, 
you know, lots of lots. I remember when um when I was living here in Indianapolis, I went to school 42 over on the west side. And I remember someone driving by and shooting a gun. And I remember all the kids taking off running. Right. So when I was in Columbus and been able to go to a nice place and just have fun with other girls and not even think about guns being shot out. Right. That space meant something to me. Let's bring in some testosterone to our conversation. Oh. <laughs> Robert. I guess that's the Robert Vane. <laughs> I guess that's me. <laughs> uh, you're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. McAllister Machinery, your friendly local neighborhood Caterpillar dealer and the Union Station and Grand Hall at Union Station Conference Center, uh, downtown Indianapolis. You mentioned a few things earlier about education. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you mentioned was the word first being in front of people's names. Mm-hmm. And we have one. Mm-hmm. And that's the new IPS superintendent. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to a little bit, please, about Alicia Johnson and your connection to IPS and mm-hmm. what you think this uh, appointment will mean for the city and the district and the neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. A, a couple of things come to mind when I think about our new superintendent, the passion that she has. Like, you cannot fake passion. And that lady is very passionate about education. And I think it comes across whenever she speaks, whenever you're in her space. She really what she really wants what's best for our kiddos. And I appreciate that. Now, not to take away that there, there is a business to everything that we do, but I feel like her passion is so important. Um, she's a mother. She comes from, she has kiddos in the system. Um, she comes from a, a family of educators. So she knows the work and she knows what success looks like. Um, I think it is important that she's the first in for our babies to see someone that looks like them in that space. And I think oftentimes when we talk about the first, that we forget about what it means to that generation that's looking up to the individual that holds that title and holds that position. And so I think that's going to stay with our kiddos, with our young folks, as they watch our new superintendent navigate this very complex system. And you had a good relationship with Superintendent Farabee, as I, I recall. Did. I did. And so, so like I, I'm, you know, people give me different titles when it comes to education. I truly just want what's best for our babies. And so, again, whether it's a public school or it's a charter school, it's a private school, I just want all of our kids to have access to a quality education. So I put myself out there. I think it's important that. I get to know the superintendent. I think it's important that I understand what their goals and visions are for the, for our, our, our kids in our community. But I, I, I'm very intentional about getting to know people in that space. I guess I should disclose that I work for IPS and directed the referenda last Mm -hmm. year, just in case there's some sort of podcast ethics Mm -hmm, commission mm -hmm, of which mm -hmm, I'm not aware. mm -hmm. (laughs) You mentioned earlier what has been a very uh, terrific partnership with Al Hubbard. Mm -hmm. And so Al, someone we'd like to try to get on the podcast. Uh, He has an incredible business career. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, um, went to Harvard business school with president George W. Bush Mm -hmm. and was a long time is a long time friend actually worked in the administration, Mm -hmm. but came back here and has really focused much like Fred Klipsch in a philanthropic way, but also in a policy way on education, Mm -hmm. Uh, education choice, just as broadly defined as possible. Mm -hmm. What led to your uh, connection and collaboration with Ala Hubbard? And what did you learn from that? Mm -hmm. So, Or what did you teach him from that? (laughs) I'm not sure if I taught Al anything. (laughs) However, first of all, let me say Al is an amazing individual. And if you think about two people being different, Al and I are like peanut butter, jelly, um, <laughs> like we are very different individuals. Um, politically, we are different. Our upbringing is different. However, we landed on education. We both agreed that it was important that again that our kids have access to a quality education. So we came together and uh, with the Mind Trust, 
and started pulling in people who agreed on education. The group was so diverse. It is diverse, um, different educational backgrounds, um, different um, area of, of expertise, racially diverse, um, just this a very diverse group coming together for the sake of our kids and coming up with policies, um, recommendations around education. Um, again, not sure. I, I, yeah, I can't say exactly what I taught Al, but again, I felt like we were able to move the needle um, at with the, the purchasing up of old IPS schools for a dollar. We pushed that. We went and had conversations with our state legislators, um, with the folks in the education space. Like we put our differences aside for the sake of our children. But in the education realm, is it fair to say there are fewer differences than there are in other policy areas? like immigration or mm-hmm, abortion. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and that's not what this podcast is about specifically or generally. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there does seem to be a couple of areas where the Democrats are kind of, and liberals are kind of gravitating more towards the conservative Republican mm-hmm. side. That would be education reform. Mm-hmm. And the area where uh, Republicans slash conservatives, maybe libertarians are gravitating more towards the progressive Democrat Mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And that would be LGBT Mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those two seem to have a pretty thick Mm -hmm. Venn diagram right in the middle um, without labeling you, of course. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's so? And what do you think of people like David Harris, who we've had on the podcast, Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon Brown and Shannon Williams, who Mm -hmm. we both Mm -hmm. love, Mm -hmm. uh, who work at the Mind Trust currently. David Harris founded it. And you've got Marianne Sullivan and the list goes on and on of of people who are proud Democrats. But like, look, we need a different way. Like this way is not working. Right, right, right. And your question is. When you when, when you we, interact with them, what do you mm-hmm. think of that movement to to break the bonds of okay, this is what we thought yeah. for years, but that's yeah. not working, so let's do something yeah. else? Because on the Republican side, of which I am, there were a lot of us years ago who that said, worked. "Look, our treatment of the LGBT community isn't yeah. probably what it should be, mm-hmm. and let's have a broader conversation mm-hmm. and a broader mm-hmm. mind." Mm-hmm. So I, I I think for some of the Democrats that are slow to to move or open up their minds when it comes to education, I think it comes down, comes back to tradition. Like we are very traditional individuals and, and what our school system meant to us, that history, it's hard for us to move away from that. And then also um, we are known to advocate for workers. And so some of the movement in edu- in that education space may feel like we are no longer supporting the educators or those teachers, right? And to the core of Democrats, we 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 fight for the workers, right? And so how do we move the needle in education without insulting educators, the people who are in this space 24-7? How do we move the needle without stomping on those traditions, right? When we speak about IPS, that rich history, specifically for African Americans, it means something. Like I have family members that still will do the the, the school songs, right? Like it means something. You go to family reunion, they'll pull out those attic shirts and it's like, oh, okay, here we go down that road, right? Mm-hmm. And so that means something. So how do we talk about changing without insulting the folks who fought and lived and loved in that space for so long, right? And I think that's what we're we're up against. And so when I talk about change, I'm like, I'm not um, discrediting what you fought for and what your system stood for then, but it's not the same. And so getting people to open up their minds about what's really happening today versus what was taking place in 1956 often creates a, a, a divide, if you will. Well, and Danielle's much better to, talk about education, education policy that I am given her background mm-hmm. as a principal and work at the state. But as a preeminent leader, go ahead. I, and and so when we talk about education, there's a few, I think we all want the same thing. It's just how we get there. And this is why it's so important when we talk about education that we try not to label where we at. Because as soon as you get caught up saying, you know, Maggie, you're leaning too far this way or that way. That's when people want to 
question your motives, right? And so again, I'm a Democrat. You like you can like that's who I am. However, I do recognize that we need to continue to make changes in that education space. Like we really do. The the podcast is called Leaders and Legends. And who whom have you met who's a leader or a legend or both? Mm-hmm in your adult life or public service career here locally in three or four names mm-hmm. where there's no oh. ranking <laughs> who you are just, you walked away from and go, wow, I'm really glad I had this conversation. You mentioned Al Hubbard, who's mm-hmm. obviously a primate leader, mm-hmm. uh, but I know there are others. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I really do appreciate the friendship that I built with Al Hubbard. I am fascinated by the things that he's been able to accomplish. I think he is a, a extremely smart and giving individual. Jim Morris, like whenever I'm in this space, I'm in awe by what he stands for and whatever, what the, whatever the things that he's been able to accomplish over, over the years. Um, Joyce Rogers. Um, I'm a fan of her son. I'm, <laughs> I'm a, I, a fan of hers, been in her space. I look at her as a mentor and now a, a friend. Um, the time she's poured into me. Um, yeah, my mother, my, 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 my mother for this, indiv- for this woman to birth a child at 16 years of age and, um, didn't have a formal education and and taught me early on that I was called to do great things and repeated that over and over and and stressed the importance of an education not just a, a not just getting my high school diploma but telling me like look you're going to get out there and you're going to get a college degree I'm the first person from my family to get a college degree and so at such a young age to have that kind of wisdom I'm in awe of my mother are you in awe of some of your fellow Indiana State Indiana State grads who are <laughs> who are matriculating around the city? I know two or three of them off the top of my head. But, yeah, so if I that's... start calling out names and I get in trouble, right? Um, however, I'm going. I'm going <laughs> to. I don't know if I even want to touch this one. But there's a lot of great Indiana State alum um, walking around our our city and leaving. A mark on honor. Karen honor. Smith. Yep. Who does um, PR for the state fair. Mm-hmm. Stevie Stays, who runs the city Stevie's market. Stevie's amazing, right? Who came on, <laughs> she's on our podcast. <laughs> so I'll let you keep doing the name dropping. Because again, if I do like names, um, my husband, um, Corey Wilson, who's over at University of Leroy Indiana. Went to, Leroy is a. He, your that's husband, that's, Leroi, went yes. to ISU? Yes. Um, <laughs> Tanya Bell. You, mm-hmm. I didn't know Tanya went mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd love to have her on as well. Um, not that you're not my favorite Indiana State grad. You are. Thank you. <laughs> but we would love to have Larry Bird on Larry the uh, Bird. podcast. Did you ever get to meet him I've or met, have that conversation? Yep. And then I actually um, met his brother. So when I was a spark at Indiana State University, I was cheerleading and he was playing basketball. And Who, Eddie? When Eddie? Yes. Played? Yes. For one year he was there when I was there. So yeah, great alum. <laughs> Go I'll ahead. tell you about my Sparkette days another day. <laughs> That's another broadcast. broadcast. I just want to say the word Sparkette. I think. Yeah. I've never met one. Yes. All right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> no, I wanted to, not to be labor education, but back to the idea of women mm-hmm. serving and women voice. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had three state superintendents elected. The last three mm-hmm. have been great women leaders. Mm-hmm. And we will not see another election of a state superintendent. Mm-hmm. How... How or what do you think that might mean for the future of education policy, the future of the work of the city and some of the innovation mm-hmm. that's happened mm-hmm. in education? Um, and what does it mean for the voter? What, is, what, what does this change mean for our state? So when it, when it comes to election, I encourage all women to run for public office because we approach things differently than our male counterparts. No offense, but we really do approach things differently. And we're able to look at the big picture. I don't think we have that tunnel, sorry guys, that tunnel vision when it comes to policy. We get stuck on one issue and we one piece of the, the big picture, right? And so I encourage women, um, regardless of, of the, the, your background and your politics to run for public office. And when we don't have a female on the ballot, it hurts all of us. 
And so it's going, we're going to feel this sting of not having females at the top for quite some time. I, I believe that whether Republican, Libertarian, or Democrat, we approach the business of government different than men. So yeah, I don't think you've answered this yet. So what did lead you to run? You said it wasn't in yeah, there your was, plan. Yeah, there was nothing in my background that said I would ever run for, for public office. Now, I was fascinated with with politics and, you know, I did my part. I worked the polls. I had the honor of driving, driving some Congress folks around, but nothing about about it said like Maggie like you need to run for public office so um, I was doing minding my business doing community work on the west side um, now representative Trish Pryor went on to become a state rep it left a hole there again doing the work and then I was approached like hey have you ever thought about getting out front now it may not seem like it today but by nature I am a shy individual there's nothing about having a camera stuck in your face or a microphone in my face that said yeah let me go do this but again after a lot of praying a lot of poking I went back and did some soul searching and the only reason that I wasn't going to run for office was because I was scared I was afraid. Right? I was good in my own, my little box in my circle. Um, and again, all that prep talk about being bold and what have you, it went out the door. I was afraid of public office. And so I was like, Maggie, if that's the only reason that you're not going to do it, young lady, you need to go ahead and do it. And so I jumped and I tell everybody, it felt like I was jumping <laughs> from the tallest building ever because I really had to like live up to everything that I believed everything that my mom instilled me in me. And so I was like, okay, here we go. And so the rest, like they say, is history. When did you, I remember we're, we're fans of Cherish Pryor here mm-hmm. on Leaders and Legends. Mm-hmm. She and Andrea Scott and a few others mm-hmm. were working mm-hmm. in the council the office. City. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That was yep. 15, 16 years uh-huh. ago. When did you take over her? Um, at the end of 2008. I had one meeting in 2008 and started in 2009. We talked about, and we'll get back to Danielle, we talked about leaders here. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fair to say the, the most impactful leader or leaders uh, for the urban core mm-hmm. in the last, let's say, post Hudnut, mm-hmm. whose career started way before then, are Julia Carson and Bill Crawford. Mm-hmm. Did you get to know them at mm-hmm. all? Mm-hmm. And what did you think of mm-hmm. their leadership? Because they are they represented a true bridge from the old bad days mm-hmm. to the new not so bad days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I got to spend time with Mrs. Carson, with Congresswoman Carson, and so um, I worked with homeless veterans for many years. And if you know Mrs. Carson, she loved our veterans, and so she spent a lot of time at HFAF, and so I had the opportunity to get to know her on that level. And she was very passionate about the veterans and she was really passionate about people. Right. And so watching her navigate and watch and work the crowd, if you will, I just loved like she was true to herself. Like you, you didn't get a on and off Congresswoman Carson. What you see is what you got on a regular basis. And so she's um, responsible for all those vans. Uh, yes. Yeah. All those Hoosier mm-hmm. veterans. Who, exactly, Spanish. exactly. And so she would often talk about like, not, again, her and I never talked about me running for, again, public office. I was not where I was at in that time. But she just always talked about giving back and, and serving those in need and using your platform to help someone else out. So, yeah. And Bill Crawford. And Mr. Crawford. So Mr. Crawford, <laughs> Representative Crawford, they, he, he, the godfather. And so he was the person that if he thought while I was in politics, while he was with us, if he thought I was going down a path that he thought was dangerous, he would like pull my card and like, Maggie Ann, what you doing? What are you, what, what are you doing? So he often, we often had those conversations and we would disagree a lot. We disagreed a lot on education, but he helped me navigate politics and told me where I should be at um, and who I needed to talk to and open lots of doors for me to have conversation with folks that really wasn't a part of my circle. So yeah, I, I feel like to this day, I owe Representative Crawford a whole lot. Let me ask one more question mm-hmm. and I'll turn it over to Danielle before the five questions, which ends the show. Uh, you mentioned earlier about working with Mayor Ballard, my mm-hmm. former boss. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you enjoy the fact that you have, because this is true, such a 
terrific relationship and reputation among people who are not of your party. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember, and I'm going to dime you out so you can, we can edit this if the, Maggie says so. I went to go work for Mike Pence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you sent me a very nice text. Mm-hmm. And you said, Will you, are you going to make me governor? Mm-hmm. And my response was, Maggie, you become a Republican. I guarantee you're governor. <laughs> do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> I, re- I, I remember that. And the genesis of my comment was the <laughs> fact that how much you are liked and respected and people enjoy working with you. You know, it's tough to keep your partisan cred, which mm-hmm. everybody likes to do in politics, mm-hmm. and get things done. And mm-hmm. it's been a theme of some of our podcasts, mm-hmm. whether it's the one we did with Louis Mahern and John Mutz, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ed Tracy and Jim Kittle. Mm -hmm. We have ones coming up with Mike McDaniel and Robin Winston Mm -hmm. together. Nice. And one coming up with Paul Okuson and Michael Mm -hmm. Connor Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Different parties, Mm -hmm. same goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy that? And is it, is it important to you? Mm -hmm. So one, without sounding cheesy, I love people. Like um, I enjoy people regardless of their labels. I do enjoy my my Republican friends as well, but it 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 pushes me to think different. I'm able to grow when I surround myself with folks who see the world different than I do. Um, my time under Mayor Ballard that first year was bumpy. You know, we had the whole budget um, fiasco, but 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 after that, we were good. I also know that under my first term under Ryan Vaughn, I, I learned a lot from Ryan. I consider consider Ryan Vaughn, the, he was the, the president of the city council. I consider him a friend now. I feel like I learned a lot under under Ryan. Well, I saw um, him uh, last week before we mentioned this and mentioned this podcast, told him that we were going to be talking to you. And he said, damn good choice. Tell her I said, oh, hi. Thank you. He's a fan. Uh, yeah, likewise. And I, again, I feel like I learned a lot under, under Ryan Vaughn. And look, I studied him when I became council president. I w- went back and watched videos um, of Ryan. Um, Ryan gave me a lot of advice on how to run meetings, what not to do. So yeah, I really appreciate again, those relationships with my Republican friends. And it's, it's, it's important to me again, it pushes me, it stretches me. And it, I really do believe it makes me a better person. And then when it's all said and done, when folks bury me, I I hope that that's not the only thing they talk about is me being a Democrat, right? Like if that's all you got on Maggie Lewis, then I really (laughs) did not live my life, right? I, yeah. This is the Sparkette question. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. You get Uh -uh. to answer. You get to ask Danielle. She doesn't want to just be a Democrat. Ask her about being a spark. Well, no, I was talking about about that cheesy (laughs) poem, you know, the dash, like the dash between your birth and Mm -hmm. your death, right? Mm -hmm. What does your dash Mm -hmm. represent? Mm -hmm. So it, it, Certainly will represent far more than a Democrat. And yes. It will represent that you are a Sparkette. Mm-hmm. And now you just have to tell us what that is. Mm-hmm. What a Sparkette is? Yes. <laughs> it's a dancer, cheerleader, dancer, combination of the two. Yeah. Okay. All yep. right. <laughs> Very good. No, my question was going to be, it wasn't not about being a Sparkette, but rather if you could talk to the 10-year-old Maggie and say, give her advice, would your advice be any different than where you've ended up today? Would my advice be any differently than where I ended up today? Mm-mm. You know what? No. Like, I I believe that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be in life. And I, I don't, while I'm a planner and I like listen, like to mark things off, I don't move. So I'm a person of faith. And so I don't move until my spirit, until my God says it's time to move. I think everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. And so, no, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I'm good with it. Very good. Last five questions, Robert. You ready for those? So these uh, were, uh, let me ask you before we get to the five questions Mm -hmm. about PR professional extraordinaire Denise Hurd mm-hmm, mm-hmm, who's mm-hmm. my good friend mm-hmm. and a lot of people know her mm-hmm. and if you're friends with Maggie on Facebook 
Maggie's never posted a bad picture ever. Oh, yes, I have. Well, other people have. <sighs> Just put it on them. <laughs> I don't think you've posted an unhappy picture ever. <laughs> no. And you have such a terrific circle of friends. And I want to ask mm-hmm. you about them because a lot of them are my friends, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Deputy Mayor Angela Smith Jones, uh, Camille, mm-hmm. lover, uh, Camille Blunt, who runs the uh, Office of Minority mm-hmm. uh, Business for the city. Uh, Christian Strickland is a mm-hmm. good friend of yours, mm-hmm. who's my boss mm-hmm. at IPS. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just mentioned Denise Hurd. It's a different, and there's others. Mm-hmm. It's a different time in Indianapolis, mm-hmm. and it's a great thing. Mm-hmm. What is it like to be out and about and to be surrounded by such terrifically accomplished amazing fun always smiling mm-hmm. got something to say yes we group do. of people <laughs> it's it, look everybody needs a squad everybody need a crew and that is my crew and like when i'm down they remind me that i'm going to be okay and this too shall pass like you need that that cheering squad and my girlfriends are really that they support me through the good the bad and the ugly they know they know they know the real Maggie Ann. They know more than what I post on on social media, right? And so it's so important that you have a, a a group, and even if it's not a group, you have a couple of girls that that has your back, right? That you know that you can count on. And and my girlfriends do exactly that. I feel extremely blessed to have a crew like that in my life. And and they're and they're bad, like they're good girls. Not to boast, but I my my. Like my crew is really good. They're pretty tough to beat. They are, to right? Admit. Right. They're pretty tough to beat. And there's some more that you you didn't mention, but there's some bad babes in my group. <laughs> Did uh, as you as you drive around Indianapolis, mm-hmm. knowing that you have such a prominent role in its sustain and its growth and its mm-hmm. future, what do you see that Indianapolis needs to do? You mentioned transit earlier, but but beyond that, uh, the the theme of the podcast really is to talk about how Indianapolis has grown and who's mm-hmm. made it grow who's led and who's leading Mm -hmm. and indianapolis can't afford to stand still right play in the big leagues right right and if we're going to keep up with the orlandos and chicago's and london's of the world then we got to keep moving so to use your um, hashtag on Mm -hmm. facebook which is let's move let's move how would you recommend keeping indianapolis moving Mm-hmm. I, I One, we need to pay attention to the elections. Everybody needs to pay attention to election. People need to vote. People need to get to know the people on the ballot. We need to um, we need to select, elect bold leaders. We need to get behind our current leaders. We need to get behind Tom at Cummins. We need to get behind Rick at the at, with the Pacer and Fever. Like we need to get behind those leaders and support them and push them and, and challenge them. But then also we need to do a better job at, at warming up the bench as a community. We we often forget about that next generation. So as a community, we have to make sure that we're prepping folks to take over our city. And again, we need to start looking as ourselves as the leader, as a leading community, right? We're not this small little town. Like we are a major metro community and we need to act like that and not be afraid of that and not shy away from being a bold community. And that's something we've heard quite a bit Mm -hmm. actually is is indianapolis needs to do that and at the same time it can only be done if people are willing to set aside differences whether Mm -hmm. they're political differences Mm -hmm. or philosophical differences Mm -hmm. and it's really glad to hear you i'm really glad to hear you say that because a i know that's who you are personally Mm -hmm. and genuinely and b i just don't think we can hear it enough Mm -hmm. yeah you are listening to leaders and legends a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer, and the Crown Plaza at Union Station and Grand Hall Conference Center. We are to the five questions part of the podcast. Are you ready? I'm ready. What was your first job? I worked as a waitress at Po Folks. Yeah, we served belly washers. That is a first. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> that is a first. Uh, what was your first concert? New edition. Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike. Do you want to finish that lyric? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> I, think I, was in the, I think I was in the army when that came out. Uh, 
the 80s. If you could recommend a book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? So I have two favorite. The Bible. I love the Bible for the stories. Um, and To Kill a Mockingbird. Both of those have been very, very popular. Mm. Very popular. Um, for easy to understand mm-hmm. reasons. Right. If you could witness any event in history, be there as it happened, which event would you choose? So I am a person of faith. I, I would love to see the resignation, resignation, Lord, sorry. Um, something with Jesus. I would like to, like any event where Je- where there's his birth, his death, I would love Sermon it. on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, anything, yeah, yeah. With Jesus. Last question is, if you could have dinner with anyone living today, a couple hours off the record, whom would you oh, choose? Living today? Living today. Oh, wow. Who would it be? I know it would be Leroy. but Yeah, yeah of, of course, my husband. Um, and Leroy 3. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. One of the, one of the, the presidents. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, a president of the United States, any of them. To ask them. To ask them. What would you want to ask him? Like, what's it like? What's it like? How does it feel to, um, how do you deal with, how do you find your courage and strength to stand strong when people are attacking you? Any of the presidents, I would love to hear there. Because it's, it's, like we often talk about courage, but when you're faced with people throwing darts at you and critiquing everything that you do and say, how do you stand and own that without responding um, in a negative way or taking it so personal? Like I'm fascinated by people's courage. If you're looking for genuineness and kindness and smarts and smile and fun and hard work and a public servant, you just heard it because nobody embodies all of these things better than Maggie Lewis. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much. I appreciate your kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Strategies.com.